This is John Zaninovich. Welcome to Move My Mass. You'll be hearing from great guests talk about balancing life and being fit. Hey, I have uh, Kevin Kimmerling here today with Black Mass Divers, founder of Black Mass Divers, and that is a you know operation that assists give uh sales equipment to gear to to pretty much rescue divers and we're going to get into what all that is with kevin today so kevin welcome to the show hey john good to see you man been trying to set this up for a while a little bit i know and you know i apologize for being so dressed up you know i don't usually dress up for an episode but hey we're going to a nice dinner afterwards we are we are i was expecting the t-shirt but you, you look good, kid. <laughs> can't, can't, can't wait to go to KC Steakhouse after this. Yeah, it'll be good times. So, all right, rescue diving, black mask divers. We'll get into all that. What's your What's your uh, upbringing to get you into that? What's your background? So, I grew up in um, in West LA, and I'd I'd always been in, in the water as a kid. I've I've always been a waterman. So, I grew up surfing in Malibu, in Santa Monica, and all the way down through Newport. And when we got older, we'd do road trips down to Mexico and just surfed all over California. Um, and when I was thirteen, following that passion for the water and the ocean, uh, I started scuba diving, and I went to this really cool. Um, camp called CME, which is the Catalina Island Marine Institute okay. over in Toyon Bay. And <clears throat> that was my first introduction to diving, which I immediately fell in love with. It's one of those sports and activities that, you know, you sink or swim, you love it or you hate it. And, for and how me, old are you at this time? I was 13 years old. 13. was my first run. Okay. And completely changed my life, fell in love with it. By the time I was 14, I had been back for a second summer, had my advanced diving certifications, my deep, my night, all the cool stuff. And it just kind of kept progressing through my life. And that's how it all kind of started. Nice. Yeah. So at what age did you get certified? It's 13. Oh, you were 13 yeah, when you got 13 certified. 13 was the first one. And then 14, I had all my advanced stuff done, which um, was pretty cool. And at that age, how often were you able to go dive? Um, you know, it was funny cause I was really the, the black sheep of the family. So I was the athlete. I was the one that was always out. Everybody else was, was not really into sports or, or not that active. So it was harder for me at that age to go dive. So well, you can't uh, drive, can't so. drive, can't go anywhere. Right. Yeah. Um, can't buy any of the equipment, really expensive. Um, it was easy to go surfing, but it was hard to go dive. Yeah. But so every, every summer or every, um, Winter, actually, it was in December, we'd go to Maui for Christmas as a family. So that's where I did a ton of diving. And then as I got older, I wouldn't have to go with a guide and I wouldn't have to go with anybody else. And we would just go out diving with buddies and friends and just kept going. Yeah. And is is uh, rescue diving always associated with law enforcement or is it not? Is it? Well, it's kind of different uh, throughout the United States. It's mostly... Um, associated with either law enforcement or fire okay. um you find in the in the west coast of the united states that um most of the sheriff's departments especially all of the sheriff's departments in in california have the jurisdiction responsibility by legislature of search and rescue so rescue and recovery diving okay. anything that's swift water related or waterborne operations falls into the sheriff's office okay when you go back east it flips a little bit and it's mostly in the realm of fire departments a um, lot more water there you have a lot more fire departments um, so they're the ones that are pre predominantly the rescue and recovery teams for waterborne operations. However, you still obviously have the police teams, the sheriff teams, FBI has their own national team, which is okay. regionally located. Okay. So it's really just a first responder type um, genre. All right. So take, take me down the path from <clears throat> being 13, 14 years old, being hooked on scuba diving, trying to figure out how to get to dives yeah. to to becoming so it's it's actually kind of an interesting story that that roundabout leaves diving and then comes back to it which was okay. really cool um so <clears throat> 
was diving, was surfing, was hanging out, um, always riding mountain bikes, always being in the mountains. So I have two passions in my life, which is the ocean and the mountains. Um, I, I was a rock climber for many years competitively. I was a mountain guide for many years, did a lot of high Sierra stuff and was always either, if I wasn't at the coast and in the mountains or at the ocean, I was up in the mountains climbing. Um, so when I was in my late twenties, I had always wanted to get into search and rescue. I thought that was kind of a cool passion for me. I was doing commercial real estate in LA, making money. Everything was really cool. Um, but I always had this itch where I didn't want to be in the office. I wanted to be out there doing cool stuff. Yeah. So I was, um, at the time I was racing mountain bikes for a team called Helen's, which is a really big shop in, in LA regional team. Uh, I've been racing for them for about four years and we were on our afternoon ride up in the Santa Monica's and we came down through one of the canyons and we came upon a crash and there was a male and a female who had come around a blind corner. One was uphill, one was downhill and they hit each other. Um, both were unconscious. The um, female had broken collarbone, um, some other bad injuries. The male um, never regained consciousness. So <clears throat> we pulled the bikes apart. We pulled them apart. We got him into a rescue breathing position. We having a hard time clearing his throat. He ended up kind of being in my lap, sitting up on top of me. Um, had to have my fingers in his mouth to keep his airway open and my buddy was off calling 911 and a couple minutes later the helicopter showed up from LA County Fire and they airlifted him out and that was the kind of the last I knew about it until a couple of days later I heard that he had passed away in the hospital so he never yeah. actually recovered for his, from his injuries but that was a important moment for me where I was like this is something I think I want to do this is really cool so Long story short, we ended up moving up to Tulare County. We had always had um, a ranch and family property up here. So it was kind mm -hmm. of a place we'd come on the weekends and stuff. Yeah. So we had, a, we had a connection to Tulare County in the Sierra Nevadas. Yeah. Um, my parents ended up purchasing the Springville Inn. And we completely remodeled that and redid that and rebuilt the whole thing. And that was going really well for a couple of years back in about, um, we did that in uh, 1998. So here was my first introduction into being able to actually get onto a search and rescue team. So I reached yeah. out to the sheriff's office and said, hey, how do you go about this? I want to be a volunteer for SAR. Um, got introduced to one of the sergeants at the time who kind of took me under his wing and, and brought me on the team. And because of all my mountaineering and climbing experience, it was really easy to just jump in there. And I ended up becoming the first civilian trainer technical rescue trainer for the Tulare County Sheriff's Office. Okay. Yeah. So, Mike, yeah, I was going to ask, do you have to be in the Sheriff's Department to do this for the Sheriff's Department? So no. So, so a lot of um, departments have really robust um, volunteer teams because we can't pull it off all by ourselves just with sworn deputies. Tulare County has 1.2 million acres of jurisdiction in the Sequoia National Forest and national parks, which we um, have kind of co-jurisdiction with on a mutual aid basis. But it's huge. It's it's roughly That's half massive. the size of Tulare County. Yeah. And we're the seventh largest county in the state of California. So we have, by virtue of that, we have the largest search and rescue team in the state of California for sworn deputies, which is 25 deputies. But sometimes that's still not enough. So we go and we have volunteer teams, which augments everything that we do and allows us to complete our mission. So it's really a force multiplier of bodies. And for our volunteers in Tulare County, we probably have about 50 guys and gals that are really good at what they do. They're always available for us when we have a call come out and they're there for us. So that's kind of how I took my jump as a volunteer. Right. Um, when I did that back in 98, 99, I fell in love with it to the point where it was like, Hey, this is what I want to do. So I put myself through the police Academy, mm -hmm. um, graduated, got a job with the Tulare County Sheriff's department and boom, I was on my way. There you can, and, there, yeah. and there we went. <laughs> right. And meanwhile, you're diving as much as you can. Well, I wasn't diving a lot back then because, oh, no? you know, I was here in Tulare County and where are you going to dive? Right. Um, so the diving aspect of it took took kind of a back seat because there were different priorities that we always end up having in life. So life shifted a little bit, but then it opened 
other doors. And by virtue of now becoming a deputy, I was able to try out for the Swiftwater Dive Rescue Team in the Sheriff's Department and boom, brought me right back into the fold. Yeah. You know, going back to that accident that got you hooked or made you realize this is what I want to do, that's got to be very few people end up in that situation where you've got a gentleman kind of, I mean, he's in your lap, not doing well. Yep. And in your head, that was your moment where you said, this is what I want to do. That's got to be very few people that say that. There's got to be, I would say, the majority that say kind of traumatizing. Because, you know, when you, when I think of somebody like you and not, what you do, what other sheriffs do or police do, and you, you know what they're, do, you know what they're doing, but until you hear it and you hear the actual examples of the life and death situations, that changes the whole program. Yeah. And there's got to be, how do you, how do you prepare mentally when you go out on a, was it a mission or a rescue? I don't know what you phrase it as but because you're there's possibility you're not going to see some good stuff yeah we you're, never we never see good stuff yeah they don't call you to go pull out something good no um <laughs> and we actually we had one two days ago and it was really i'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it was really interesting to me um ptsd is a real thing and it's a real thing for the military it's a real thing for first responders law enforcement fire ems workers um, you see a lot of stuff, and the only way that we deal with that is to compartmentalize it, put it in a box, and not deal with it. Right. Or have really bad off-color jokes in private with each other, which are pretty incredible in their yeah, own yeah. right. But you that, have to that, have that, your way to deal with it. Yeah, but that doesn't cleanse it, right? Right. So we had a body recovery it was a drowning up by um orange cove a couple days ago and it wasn't a big deal the guys got there it was a pretty easy operation um it was a fresh drowning so he'd only be in the water for about an hour um they executed got him out took us longer to drive to the site than it did to recover it and do the whole thing but what caught me as interesting was on the way home i got a text from a buddy of mine and it said hey it's really sad to see you guys on the news again and that's what kind of, that kind of tripped me up a little bit because it was like on scene, we're like, okay, yeah, another, uh, sorry, another dead guy. Right. Um, sorry for the loss, but we move on. This is what we do. And that comment or that text that came back to me that afternoon was like, it, it, it reestablished a little bit and made me think about why we're doing this again and why we're in the service of others. Um, there's been a lot of calls that we've had in search and rescue and dive where I've gotten all the way home and I don't remember pulling into the driveway and I'm sitting in the car, the radios are off, yeah. the stereo in the car is off. It's been an hour and a half drive and I don't remember how I got there. Yeah. I can only, I, I mean, and, I and can't we, imagine. And we do that a lot. Been... It happens a lot. Yeah. So, you know, we, we have a really robust system where we pre-brief everything, we debrief everything. We have a culture on our team in the sheriff's department that's really healthy and we make sure that we take care of each other and we make sure that everybody's head is on straight because it doesn't take a lot to get you freaked out about something and it doesn't take a lot to ruin your concentration and when we're in waterborne operations whether it's swift water or blackout water where we're on a dive op everybody's head has to be there yeah so yeah, it has to through all those pre-dive checks and all the debriefs we, and, and the, just the re tight relationship that we have, um, it's really easy to be able to check each other and look into each other's eyes and say, you're good. You're good today. Or, or Johnny, you're not good today. And I'm not going to let you dive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, there's no way I can even relate to what you guys do or anybody that's in that kind of situation. But I did, you know, when we were in farming, we had a tractor driver going down the road one time, pulling, he was pulling a juice bin behind him and he was making a left turn, but the poor gentleman that was driving the tractor, as he's making a left turn, somebody was passing him. So the car hit him, flipped the tractor and he, I don't know how it happened, but he never left the seat of the tractor. The tractor was completely upside down with the steering wheel smashing his head. 
Yeah. And I was the first one on the scene. I was there within five minutes of the accident. So it was just down the road from our office. Nothing. I, I mean, I can't lift a tractor off the gentleman. And he, he was, it was obvious he was gone. But I was just sitting there next to this tractor waiting for CHP or whoever was going to come, ambulance, whoever was coming first. And it took a while for everybody to get there. And I, you know, I, I just can't imagine the things you guys see on a frequent basis. And I don't know which way that goes. Do you get numb to it or do you, is it, or is it just a little lower level of, holy shit, this is another bad one. You know, just- you, you completely get numb to it and, and you have to, it is a survival mechanism at that point. Um, but it's not healthy because these things stay with you and every once in a while they creep back. Yeah. Um, we, we've had a couple seasons up in this area and we had normal snow years and we had good water years in the spring where we're doing 30 to 35 missions a summer. And this is just swift water and dive rescue. And the majority of those missions aren't happy ones. We're right. doing recoveries at that point just because of the technical nature of all of our rivers here in the Sierra. Yeah. Um, and we get to a point, I remember it was 2012 through about 2014, where there were so many missions and so many body recoveries that you don't remember the names anymore. You count them down by numbers. So we were, and these were like, let's say all on the Thule. I remember number five on the Thule in one summer. Yeah. And it was just, we called that gentleman number five. Yeah. We brought him home to his family. We'll always bring them home to their family, but we have to have some kind of disconnect. And when I say that that mechanism is good for us in the front end, it's not really good in the back end because it, it stays there, like I said before. So. Um, two years ago, we had a 16 year old boy that drowned on mother's day in the Thule, kind of the same area by the stairs. And it took us three months to recover his body. And we knew right where he was, but we had to wait till the flow went down. And I spent every single day on the phone with that family, yeah. giving them a sit rep and what was going on checking the flows, how we were going to pull this off, when we were going to pull it off, windows not open. I had X amount of helicopters fly this week, on and on and on. And when we finally recovered his body, I lost it. Yeah. yeah. I, I was mentally done. Yeah. Over um, that amount of time, now you become really connected. Oh, yeah. To the, and, to the situation. And it was just, it was over. I just completely fell apart. Yeah. Um, and that was one of those releases. And I think they come more and more in my career. You know, when you're, when you're young and doing this, you're untouchable and yep. On to the next one, on to the next one, on to the next one. Yeah. When you get older and you get wiser and you've been there enough and now you're no longer the young buck, but you're the gray beard teaching the young bucks. Um, it's my responsibility now to really teach them how to deal with this kind of stuff because right. they're going to be in my shoes one day running this team and having these ghosts that come back and bite them every once in a while. And if we don't have the mechanisms to deal with it, bad things happen to us. We lose marriages. We lose family. We mm -hmm. get into alcoholism. We commit suicide. It's just all bad stuff. Yeah. Well, I certainly, I damn sure know what you do now. <laughs> this, is, this is pretty, even though I knew, but now I, now I got a crystal clear picture of what you do and I'm pretty damn sure my listeners do. So let's take this in a little, little lighter direction. Sure. Yeah. Cause, uh, the respect is incredible, you know, and you know, our mutual friend, Chris Boudreau, who's CHP, yeah. of course, you know, I tease him all the time when I, I mean, I've got respect for anybody. Well, I, I have respect for everybody, but especially law enforcement, first responders, whatever you want to call everybody that does what you guys all do. You know, of course I tease them, you know, how many parking tickets you write today, you know, just to keep it light. Cause I'm not going to talk to him on a date. I know what, I can't imagine what it feels like for him. All right. So he is pulling somebody over for a speeding ticket. Sounds easy, right? He has no clue what's who's no. in that car. And I mean, I didn't mean to, dig yeah, I did mean to digress, but I'm only saying that because yeah, I, completely respect what you do and knowing what you do but to hear it like this takes it to a complete different level and 
I'm sure my listeners are probably like, yeah, th- these guys do a lot for us. Yeah, and I'll and I'll say just for Chris himself that all those CHP and police guys, they all want to be sheriff's deputies when they grow up. Oh, I know they 100%, do. I know 100%. They do. And yeah, hopefully he's listening. <laughs> we're, you're right. If but, not, we'll rib him later. Right. So let's take this. All right, black mass divers. How did that? How did you start that? Well, I know why you started it, probably, but yeah, tell me how you started that program. Cool. So. Um, and wait, I, I, before, before you go, yeah, black mass divers. So for me, first, tell me what that means. For me, it means, and I think I'm wrong, it means you can't see when you're diving, or does it mean the mask is actually black? No, you're wrong. It means the mask is actually okay. black. As I was reading today, I think I figured out that I was wrong, because before, before today, I always thought, well, they call it that because they can't see when they're diving, because of what you guys do. It's not like you're... It's not like you're going on rescue missions, missions in Bahamas and beautiful turquoise water. No, you know, no, here I in, wish, <laughs> right? <laughs> so yeah, I was completely wrong. And I, as I was reading up and doing research, today, I'm like, oh, okay, that's what that means. But anyway, so, so like, yeah, how did you start your organization? My common denominator in life is is passion and doing cool, fun stuff. Um, I let's, never. Let's, I'm going to stop you again. That's not what you do. You go do dangerous shit. We do do dangerous shit. <laughs> that is that is that is your slogan, correct? It is. It's one of them. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Sorry. And, and we do it above and below. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So I interrupt. Yeah. Go ahead. But that's fun for us, right? Yes, it is. It is. Um, doing your triathlons and and racing bikes and riding mountain bikes. That's fun for us. That's, Living life. That can be dangerous shit too. Right. It's all right there. Yeah. Um. But it comes back to the passion. So um, running our team and, and being our team and seeing what was going on, um, all teams go through a stage of growing periods. And our team certainly did as well. So when when I first got on the team as a young deputy, everybody was using recreational dive gear. Nothing was standardized. Um, there was, it was just the equipment was dangerous. The, the protocols were dangerous. And the culture of this is the way we've always done it okay. is dangerous. So I knew there was a better way. And I started doing some research with a colleague who was a sergeant as well. And um, we, we found a company called Dive Rescue International, which is, ends up being the largest training and equipment company for public safety diving, rescue and recovery diving mm-hmm. in, in the world. And we put ourselves through one of their classes and boom, the light bulb went on. It was like, holy crap, we're doing everything wrong. And we need to fix this because it's only by a virtue of God that we haven't killed somebody yet. So let's figure it out and let's use this SOP, standard operating procedure, and let's bring it back and fix our team because we're not doing it right. We can't do it the good old boy any way anymore. You know, it's not 1984. It's, 2000 we got to fix stuff okay um so we did that and we started rebuilding our team from ground up um cut a lot of dead weight brought the standard of um of operational expertise and training way up brought physical fitness requirements way up and then started getting all the gear and putting it all together um that was a couple year process but what it's done is it's turned Tulare County Sheriff's Office dive team into one of the most respected teams in California. Mm-hmm. We're a type one Cal OES team. We go all over the state on mutual aid. And we're kind of known a little bit throughout the United States as the same thing because we're just a busy team. We're very active in what we do. Um, went a little too far. Let me back up a little bit. So when I was on that journey, um, I had a lot of mentors in at Dive Rescue International who started to take me under their wing and say, hey, we want you to be one of our corporate instructors. And okay. totally humbling. I mean, I couldn't believe it. These are my heroes that are now saying, hey, we want you to be one of us. So I went through a ton of um, schooling and training with those guys and became a Dive Rescue International corporate trainer. Yeah. I'm also a NAWI dive instructor and instructor trainer. Um, So now I get to go all over the United States with Dive Rescue International and train other teams and bring other teams that were where we were up into the um, 
best industry practices and best industry standards. Okay. So there's where the passion really is. And when I was doing this, I started realizing, hey, there's nobody out there that's really supporting these men and women in rescue and recovery diving. There's nothing out there for them. And how many are there in California, more or less? Well, you've got, what, 55 counties in California. So you have 55 teams plus all the fire teams and everybody else. There's thousands and thousands of divers. Okay. And across the United States, I mean, tons. I would. Right. I don't even have a number to give you, John. Yeah. I'm not yeah, sure. So it's huge. It's huge. Absolutely huge. And so, I mean, it is educational for me because I don't, like, okay, there's probably a couple in Tulare County. Like, it just, I don't know. It's brand new to me. Think about. Even though I. Think about every sheriff's department in the United States, half of the police departments, all the large police departments, and every single fire department has a dive rescue team. Okay. So Did there's a lot that. out there. Yeah. Obviously. And, and it's one all of right. those, I mean, one of the things that we always joke about is we're, this is a, an unknown industry really, because, you know, there's a drowning or there's a rescue event that happens. Search and rescue comes out. Dive rescue comes out. It's a sheriff's department. It's a fire department. That's what they do. They work their operation yeah. and they go home and that's it. And nobody really understands what all goes into that. And I felt it was really important to bring that to light. So we started Dive Rescue International, or not Dive Rescue International, but Black Mass Divers to bring awareness and support and equipment and just cool stuff for all these people to bring it into the light and show and let them be proud of their craft, but yeah. also show it off to everybody else. And it's been, it's been a hoot. That, it's been so cool. Well, and it's growing fast. It's, growing really fast. That is awesome to see, you know, you know, talking to uh, Jill, she's like, I remember just taking like a few things down to the post office every day that people would order from you. And now it's just good, big. Yeah. You know, like, now it's it, loaded it was, up. It was, it was kind of funny. She, Jill's my wife. She um, comes running into the uh, room two days ago and she goes you're at eleven thousand followers it was just it was cool because we you know we launched in september of 2019 yeah so it's That's it's awesome. growing and it's it's all because of the men and women in this group of of divers um our culture is one throughout the united states worldwide i mean we sell orders all over the all over the world um we're all in it together and we all yeah. have a same and uh, same common bond and goal, and it makes us really tight as an industry, and it's really cool. Right, and I think you might have said something earlier, which probably explains all this. You know, it's like it's no longer 1984. It's not a good old boy net network. Mm -hmm. Can't be run like that anymore. Mm -hmm. You've taken it to a modern day level. You brought some mojo to it. That's what yeah. you've done. That's exactly what you've done. Or looking from the outside, that's what it looks like. Right. Let's make this right. Let's make it better. Let's make it. And you're, you know what? And you're probably also making it a little more, more people want to do it or maybe explore it. Yeah. I think we're bringing exposure to it, which is what's really cool. You know, I don't care necessarily what training agency you got your rescue and recovery diving certification from. Obviously I'd rather have it be dive rescue international because quite frankly, we're the best. But if it's through like Arity that. or some of other course people, you're the best. well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But it's, if it's through some other people, I, I don't care as long as all the everybody's safe and we're doing it to a common standard to provide a common goal. I want to make sure that all these teams have the backing from their departments, the backing from their from their public, um, to get the right kind of equipment. Because I'm still amazed at teams that don't dive to the safest standards and don't have the equipment and it's really one of these things in law enforcement and fire of you know what's the shiniest coolest thing out there right. so the SWAT teams get all the money and I know it because I was on SWAT for a bunch of years yeah the dive team doesn't get anything because the brass doesn't understand what they do so if the if the executive management doesn't realize really what their teams are doing it's not because they're stupid men and women, they're just ignorant to that part of it. So one of the things I did and one of the things I always preach to the teams that I go train is, hey, if you're having trouble with money and equipment, you need to go sell yourselves. So 
we, what I did in Tulare County was start making videos of all of our training and all of our operation. And you'd be amazed when the sheriff and the under sheriff and all the captains start watching some of these clips of, whoa, that's where you guys are. That's what you're doing. Right. No idea. So all of a sudden that light bulb comes on and we start getting funding and the equipment that we need. And it works across the board. I don't care who you work for. It's great. Yeah. So that, that's what I really preach to help these guys get what they need so they can be successful and safe. And outside of the equipment, what what's the physically, what's the most important way to prepare for what you guys do? Is it cardio? Um, is it is it everything? I think like, it's everything, John, really. Um so we have so there there's a um there's an industry standard swim test, swim certification that's mm -hmm. used for public safety diving. It's called the IATERS. And it's the International, uh, International Association of Dive Rescue Specialists. And basically what it is, it's a, it's a 500 times swimmed. It's an 800 snorkel kick with fins. It's a 100 um, full kitted out body drag in the water uh, with an unconscious diver. Then it's 15 minutes uh, treading water. And the last three minutes, your hands are up out of the water so yeah. it's it's for a lot of people that sounds really intimidating when you train for it it's not bad at all so basically when you boil all that out how they figured out how to make that swim test was make it a metabolic equivalent of x y and z which comes out to kind of like an eight minute mile that you're running a 5k and what they were looking for is to see you know they know how much physical strength you have to have when you're swimming in the water, swift water, whatever else, and yeah. they need to have a reserve. So they set that metabolical equivalent. So you would always be operating at like 75% of your total capacity. Yeah. Um, so that's all scored and numbered out. Um, my guys on my team, the, the main score to pass that every year and what we try to give teams, we say, look, you guys have to, if you're not doing it, you got to do it every single year because we're not, we're not killing public safety divers because of equipment failures. We're killing them usually because of fitness. Yeah. Um, it's got to be there. Because right, when you're right. in that oh shit moment, you can't breathe underwater and you're fighting a current in swift water, you're going to get your ass kicked. Right. You have to have the confidence and the physical fitness to get there. So the minimum score on that through the United States is, is a 12. Um, 12 out of 20. 20 is number one. You, you nailed everything. It's the highest score you can get. To give you how serious it is for my guys, they bumped up that score to a 16 all on their own. So that's just pride of being on that team. So what's your what's your personal routine? So my routine to, to is, and, and I wish I could do more, but right now I'm just in that tough spot, right? I've got a full-time career with the Sheriff's Office, which is mm -hmm. awesome. And then I've got Black Mass Divers, which is a second full-time career. Yeah. So timing is, is getting shorter. Um, but usually what I'll do is uh, two days in the pool every single week, and that'll mm -hmm. be about 4,000 yards, so mm -hmm. 2,000 yards a day, and then hit um, the gym every other day the rest of the week yeah. and then try to do cardio on the weekends with jill whether it's riding our road bikes or mountain bikes or going for a hike or going for a cross-country run whatever we can do right yeah that sounds like a perfect routine for it uh, you it, know it, one, it one thing that's nice about swimming because i swim a lot is yeah once you get that base and you've had the base for a while it doesn't seem to leave so much yeah like, i can get a base and running I stop running. It's, it's like gone, I've never right? ran before in yep. my life. Yep. Swimming, I can jump in the pool and it just seems to come back. Yeah. And, you know, we yeah. have crazy days. Like, it was so funny. Um, when we had that last body recovery, my, I, I swim with one of my sergeants. Um, and actually, we have our IATERS, our annual IATERS test at the end of August. So all the guys are now swimming a lot and getting prepared for it because yeah. – their goal is to always beat the old man, which is me. And my rule is nobody beats me in the pool. Nobody's ever beat me in 15 years in the pool. It's not going to happen in 2021 just, just either. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> they could try all they want. Um, yeah. But it was so funny because life gets in the way, especially when you're in law enforcement. We were supposed to swim that afternoon and we got this dive call out. So everything changes. And he came up to me, he goes, dude, 
I am sweating my ass off. I've got these friggin' board shorts on under my pants right now because we were supposed to go swimming. And I look at them, I go, oh yeah, me too, dude. <laughs> it was horrible. It's like a hundred degrees out there. We're standing up on the bank of the Frank Kern Canal. And it's like, oh, I'd rather be swimming right now. All right. You probably know every inch of that Frank Kern Canal. <laughs> uh, yeah. From Fresno to Bakersfield, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a younger person that wants to get in this, what do you recommend? How do they, how do they do it? Um, you, you know, it, it, it's the first thing they have to do is really want to be in law enforcement, public safety, the fire service. Um, cause that's the only way you're really going to be able to be on one of these teams. The gotcha. kind of the industry standard is you have to be associated with a department to start doing this because we have a concept, especially in California of, um, what we call, um, convergent volunteers. And it's people just showing up to large search and rescues and saying they want to help. And when you have a big operation going on, you, you, it's like herding cats. You yeah, can't have yeah. people like that showing up. So we have right. to regulate it to just departments. And mostly throughout the United States, at least in California, there's almost zero volunteer swift water or dive rescue teams just because of the dangerous nature of it. Back East, there's mm -hmm. a lot more, um, which is not good or bad. It's just a different way okay. of doing things. So if somebody wants to get into this, they're really going to have to get into law enforcement or fire. Um, and then it's all about having that mindset of really wanting to help people, really wanting to do this. You know, I see a lot of guys like, so we'll have a, um, we'll have an open recruitment in a couple of weeks for our dive team. Mm -hmm. And all these guys who are deputies have been given three months notice to get their shit together mm -hmm. and given every opportunity to say, hey, this is what's about to happen to you. This is what you need to stay focused on. This is the swim test. This is the medical test. Be prepared for it and don't waste our time. Yeah. All the way up to having a meeting with my senior divers who bring them into a room privately and very frankly tell them what they're about to get into. Um, and we'll see 12 people come out and we'll have three candidates left over at the end of pool day. So you have to have a lot of heart and you want to have to do it. If you're in this business to just wear a patch and get some overtime and look cool, not it's going right to eat you up. It's not yeah. for you. Yeah. And I'm going to weed you out if you're in my neck of the woods because it's too dangerous and it's too important. Right. Everybody's got to go home. So, you know, we, we've hit on all the, all the deep hard stuff. How about, can you recall one of your more positive rescues? like that sticks out in your head, like you didn't think it was going to go right and it ended up going right and just like made your, like, this is why I do this. Do you recall one of those moments? Um, it wasn't really on a, it wasn't really, I, I've had a bunch on rescues. So mountain rescue stuff, just a ton. Um, helicopter inserts, go find people, walk them out, hike them out, fly them out. That kind of stuff is always really cool. But by nature of, our swift water and our lake environments, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of water rescues yeah. that we're able to deal with because you get into the Kern River, you know, yes. or get into the Thule River, it's going to eat you. And if you don't get spit out right away, you're going to drown. Yeah. It's really simple. So right. there's only two things that happen when we get a call of somebody in the river. They're either out or they're stuck on a rock in the middle or they're already gone. Right. Um, but I did have a really cool, um, recovery operation a couple of years ago. It was actually an AOA for Cal OES. And it was when we had just finished. Okay, back up on all that. Okay. AOA? Go for it. What's AOA? So we were assisting another agency, which okay. was Kern County. Okay. And they had a, they had a, um, drowning up in, uh, Isabella. Okay. Up in the big lake. And they had worked it for a couple of days and they just weren't having any luck. Um, so they called Cal OES and said, Hey, we need help. Get us to Larry County. And we got put in touch with them and we actually work with them quite a bit, almost all summer long. So it's, yeah, they're just, they're just brothers that are cousins. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we showed up and, and did our thing and it was an interesting case because it was a mid water drowning off of a houseboat. Um, there was no witnesses to it, but the whole thing had been filmed via cell phone by one of the victim's friends. 
And this guy jumps off the boat, doesn't know how to swim. It's a high wind day in the afternoon and the boat takes off. And he's the only one that knows how to drive it, drive it, almost drowns instantly. And there's nobody left on the boat or there's nobody left on the boat that can drive it. So the boat literally just sits in the wind and drifts for a couple hours and finally hits shore. And somebody's able to call 911 and Kern County shows up immediately and starts their search pattern. Why I said all that is because they were in the wrong place for a couple of days. Uh, so when we showed up, we had all of their information. We had their witnesses. We brought them out on our boats and we did the same thing. And we kept coming up at the end of the first day of this doesn't feel right because we're not seeing anything. We have side scan sonar. We have ROVs. We have all the cool high tech stuff. And when my guys are mowing the lawn with the side scan sonar on the boat, they're seeing a beautiful bottom contour. If there's nothing there. We would have seen this guy. Um, so there was a computer glitch with the cell phone video that we weren't able to see it until like late that afternoon. And when we finally saw it, we were like, huh, we may be in the wrong spot. So we, we redirected our efforts, we had to go home. It was late in the day, but we said, Hey guys, we'll be back up the next day. Yeah. And that night, my team took the video, ripped it, took stills out of it and did a reverse triangulation and said, okay, we're going to look at all these landmarks. So in the morning we can take the boat out and basically figure out where we were. Make sense? Totally. Yeah. So that morning we get there at six o'clock by 7 a.m. My boys are in their boat and they figure out a spot. They're like, this is it. And they drop their first target buoy. The other boat comes in with our side scan sonar, starts working. Within 30 minutes, they have a target hit. And their buoy was dropped 50 feet from where his body was located. Yeah. And that was one of my, and then they, they went and did the dive. It was a deep dive, an altitude dive. It was about 75 feet deep, 3,000 foot of elevation. So they had to do all their calculations for decompression mm -hmm. and everything else, which is a big deal at that altitude. Uh, it's not just a regular dive where you just go get it. Blackout yeah. conditions on the bottom. Yeah. Um. So you could you can't see anything at all, um, but they did that whole dive and recovery in about twenty minutes, and that was one of my proudest moments because from beginning to end, they they nailed it. They did it all as a team, and all that training for them just came together, and they just nailed it. It was huge. So right. I, I remember at the end of the debrief, I was like, "Okay, my work here's done. I'm out. <laughs> so you guys, you do that. You yeah. guys just killed it." Yeah, it had to be a proud moment because, you know, everything you trained for, everything you implemented got used and yeah. nailed it. And it's, and you know, it goes back to building that culture of we're, we're in it together. You know, I've been in SWAT, I've been in SAR, I've been in specialty teams, I've been in all the investigative units. I've never seen a team, and I can say this for water rescue teams all over the United States, there's not a tighter bond of, between teammates than those guys that work water rescue operations whether yeah. it's dive or swift water um we had a bad deal on the on the Thule a couple of years ago uh, where two girls from bakersfield drowned they were college students uh, one slipped in the other one tried to save her they both drowned instantly in a place at the stairs mm -hmm. um I know where that is yeah oh. and it eats people every year yeah. um we had a near miss that year it was a high water year the Thule was like when it should have been at like 300 cubic feet per second. It was ripping at almost 2000. It was huge. Um, tidal wave big. And we had, you know, what people don't understand is when, when we're forced into these situations to go rescue and, or look for somebody, I'm putting my guys in the same environment that killed that person, that person. Yes. And that's a big deal. Um, so we had the boat in the water, we we're doing a tether search and something the guys had done a million times before. Everything's cool. No big deal. And I remember Cole and Brad were in the boat and they were inching it up towards this pour over waterfall. And it's what we call a hydraulic. And I kept telling him on the radio, back the boat up because you guys are getting a little too far up in there. And gunshot, heart attack fast, that boat yard sailed and went upside down. And I had two of my guys in class six water. Cole stays with the boat. Brad gets flushed into what we now call Brad's hole, which is a 25 foot hydraulic keeper, which ultimately killed both of the girls prior. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you get into one of those holes, 
it, it, you recirculate vertically. Yep. And Brad came up after recirculating about two times. And one of my other guys hit him with a throw bag, got him, pulled him to shore. And in the process of doing that, dislocated his shoulder, the guy on shore. Um, obviously everybody's freaked out. I'm getting goosebumps now. Um, we stop for the day. Brad goes down or, um, Brad and, um, Ron go down to the hospital to get checked out by the meds. One of my paramedics who was on my team at the time, put his shoulder back in, but I was a sergeant. I still said, Hey, you're going down there, get it checked out. Um, my team at debrief said, I told them we were done for the day. They said, nah, let's keep going. Yeah. Let's, let's keep going. We'll just shift gears. We'll do something different. We won't get back in the water. We won't scare you again. We promise, Sarge, everything's good. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And it was cool. But what was really amazing is Ron comes back from Sierra View two hours later and says, put me in the game. Where, where do you need me? And I'm like, man, you just dislocated your shoulder and you are back to work. That's that culture I keep talking about. That's special. Yeah, and that's that's who you're looking for when you're. That's who we're looking for when we're looking for new candidates on these teams. Right. And if you don't bring that, there's only so much. I, I can teach you everything. I can teach you how to dive. I can teach you how to be a swift water operator. But if you don't bring that that heart, that I can't teach. You I can't. can't give I was you just going to say you know? that you can't teach that part, mm -mm. but you can see it. So that's your job to see it in somebody. Right. Yeah. We'll cultivate a little bit. Yeah, you but can. There's yeah. got to be a spark there. Yeah, yeah. You can you can trim that bush up a little bit how you like <laughs> how you like it. But exactly. You're yeah. You're able to see it. Man, it's been great talking to you. They can follow you on at Black Mask Divers. Yeah, at Mask. Uh, so it on um, both Instagram and Facebook at Black Mask Divers, and then www.blackmaskdivers.com is our website, and a lot of cool new stuff coming. Yeah, love it. Um, always had respect for you, what you guys Thanks, do, but brother. it just went a thousand fold after this. <laughs> I know my listeners are going to enjoy this. So thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it, John. Always let's, good to see you, brother. Let's go have a damn good dinner. Let's do it. Man.